Who has their Christmas shopping done? Raise your hand, just curious. What? You guys. You're so proud of yourselves, aren't you? Raise your hand again. I mean, I'm just, I'm a little jealous. I haven't done much Christmas shopping yet. Heidi, what do you want for Christmas? <laughs> I asked her the question. I didn't hear the answer. I know there's an Amazon wish list. I'd better check it out soon. Well, a really nice gift to give during Christmas is a family board game, right? It forces us to put away our cell phones to actually talk face to face and interact together. And there's a few games that really stand out to me that really shape my values, particularly as they pertain to personal finance. And the first game, I really probably cannot recommend on Christmas Day, but do it if you want. And it's the game of Monopoly, right? Because <laughs> how do you win in Monopoly? You get all the money, and what happens to everybody else? Everyone else gets bankrupt, okay? And in the process of winning, you may go to jail, but that's just part of it, part of the process. But there's one happy person at the end of the game, Monopoly, and everyone else is pretty ticked off because they've got nothing. Well, then there's this other game called Payday. This is a little simpler, a little bit faster game, which I remember playing this as a kid. It looks like a monthly calendar. And every week, you are taught at this very young age, I think it's made for ages eight and above, you play the lottery every Saturday. <laughs> and if you don't have enough money, you borrow money on credit at 10% interest. It's setting up our children for student loans and credit card debt. It's a terrible game, terrible game. One of my favorite games, though, is the game of life. And I didn't bring the whole board game up here. And life is a pretty fun game, right? But it all depends on the spin of the wheel. You spin the wheel, you know, you're going to get married. That happens in the game. But you spin the wheel. And you miss all the kids have a child spaces. You end up with a minivan with four empty seats, right? <laughs> Not what you hope for. You spin the wheel again, pay $25,000 for tennis camp. Does tennis camp really cost $25,000? Spin the wheel, tornado hits your house, right? Unless you have insurance, you are out of a ton of money. Spin the wheel, get flooded, spin the wheel, pay $100,000 for cosmetic surgery. <laughs> Did you know this is actually a space? And so based on this game, you either end up, you were hoping to end up at millionaire estates, but instead you end up at the countryside acres, right, without enough money. No matter how much strategy you had, good planning, this can just happen and it kind of reflects real life. We think we're going to go up all the ladders and we end up going down all those chutes. Cars break down, medical diagnosis occur, your crypto investments tank, a deal falls through, someone laughs about that. It's not funny. No, it didn't happen to me. But it happened to a lot of people. It did happen to a lot of people and no shame, no shame. And then you have those, all those damaged relationships that really come to the surface during the holidays. And it, it is no laughing matter. Those unlucky spins really frustrate us. But I want to talk to you about God's provision, especially in those times when we are frustrated, when it doesn't seem like things are working out. What is God doing? How is he working? And in the place where we are truly feeling less hopeful than we want to feel, God wants to surprise us. He wants to meet us in those places. And at Christmas, we always talk about the birth of Jesus. We celebrate the arrival of the Messiah. But there's a part of the Advent story that is often overlooked that is a significant part of the story. The Jews believed during the time of Jesus, and they even believed this day, that there would be a forerunner of the Messiah who would come. And he would come, he would be Elijah, actually, either like Elijah, or it would be Elijah himself who would precede the coming of the Messiah. And so interwoven into the Christmas story is the birth of this particular individual. And as he, as he is born, it ushers in a new era, a new era in God's redemptive plan. And we're going to look at that story today, because his arrival shocked his parents as much as anybody. It's found in Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 5. It says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in God's sight, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly, but they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. <laughs> so you have these two godly people, 
from a priestly heritage. Both of them are from uh, priestly families. And the Bible describes them as righteous and blameless. These people are the real deal. Real people of faith committed to the Lord. And even though they're righteous and even though they're blameless, they're unable to have a child. They've been honoring God their whole life. And now they are very old. My question is, is what is very old? <laughs> what is very old? I think it means it's anyone who's 20 years older than you. <laughs> Do you agree with that? Anyway, I mean, it kind of moves as you get older, but if they're 20 years older than you, they're very old. So they were 20 years older than Luke when he wrote this. So Zechariah means, literally, it means God has remembered. And the Zechariah in this story is not to be confused with the Old Testament prophet Zechariah. There's like three Zechariahs in the Bible. But this, this, is, this Zechariah is married to Elizabeth. Her name means God is reliable. His name means God has remembered. Her name mean, means God is reliable. So even in their names, there is this expression of God's faithfulness and his reliability. But they're living during a time of political turmoil, the time of Herod the Great. It's politically a mess. There's spiritual corruption, political corruption, superficial spirituality, oppression. But throughout their life, leading up to this point, they have been repeatedly disappointed. They had this reoccurring disappointment. Try as they may, they could not get pregnant. And in those days, infertility was about the worst thing that could happen to a married woman. It was definitely stigmatized, way worse then than it is today. They actually believed that fertility was part of the blessing of living an obedient life. And so they took the opposite to be true as well. They believed that barrenness was a sure sign of God's disapproval. For infertility, a man was allowed to even divorce his wife. And a married woman without children sadly would be shunned and looked down upon. And so they were a disappointment to their families. In fact, later in his life, Zechariah looked back on this time and he said it was a time of disgrace. That's how he felt during this time. And I wonder how much their righteousness was because they were trying to earn God's approval. Like, maybe if we just try harder, maybe if we're just more careful to keep all the commands, maybe if we just pray more, then we will receive God's blessing. But their flame of hope had long ago dimmed, flickered, and gone out. And the point I want to make at this point in the story is that even righteous people lose hope. They had truly done nothing wrong. They weren't guilty of sin. God was proud of them was honoring them, you know, he heard their prayers, and so I just want to encourage you that if you can relate to that, and you know, you're a faithful person, you're here because of that, but lately God just seems distant, increasingly distant, silent. If you're starting to think of God as being indifferent, I really want to challenge that thinking today. Don't rely on your feelings. I cannot remedy your situation, but I can tell you this for sure. God is faithful. Amen. God hears your prayers. God is present. God cares. And so our feelings don't tell us the truth. They only reveal our perception of reality. Well, then one day everything changes. Verse 8, once when Zechariah's division, division was on duty at the temple, he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen then by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord to burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. And so Zechariah is a priest, and he's given a specific assignment by lot. So he's serving as a priest, really, his whole life, but he has certain times when he goes to the temple to serve. And what is happening here is a very significant assignment. So he spins the wheel and he comes up with the most honorable thing a priest could possibly do. The greatest honor, and it would only occur once in their lifetime, where they were allowed to burn incense in the holy place. And they would burn this incense on the altar, which was in front of the Holy of Holies, only separated from the Holy of Holies by a veil. And so this was literally the closest they would physically get to what they believed to be the presence of God. So as that priest, they could get right there, and they would be right there, and they would be offering their prayers. And so this was a sacred honor. And Zechariah gets his turn, first time in his life. It's a big deal. 
He had spent his life waiting for this moment. And so the ritual begins outside the temple building. It begins on what they call the altar, the, the altar where they would offer the burnt offerings and the sin offerings. And so one priest would go to there after they offered a sin offering, after God, asking God for forgiveness for their sins. And they would get some of the charcoal that was under that offering and they would put it in a golden bowl. And so one priest would be handling the live coal from the sin offering. And then another priest would get incense and he would be carrying that into the Holy of Holies. And then there was Zechariah, the third one. And they all three would go into the holy place. The one with the hot coals would then put those coals on the altar of incense. And then the one who was carrying the incense would put the incense just to the side of that. And then they would leave. And so then Zechariah is there alone in God's presence. And he would take that incense and then put it onto the hot coals. And the smoke would begin to fill the holy place. It would even go through the veil into the holy of holies. And it was symbolic of the prayers that he is praying in that moment and that the people are praying outside. And they have this assurance that God is hearing their prayers. It was this powerful moment. And then something unexpected happens in verse 11. It says, then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. So it always happens whenever anyone sees an angel, they get terrified. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink. It's like what they called the Nazarite vow. It's going to be like that. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So, Zechariah receives this incredible vision, and he is gripped with fear. It's terrifying. The angel says, do not be afraid. Cheer up. Be of good heart. And then the angel says this, your prayer has been heard. And I wonder what prayer was heard. Like, what's the angel referring to? Is the angel referring to Zechariah's prayer in that moment? Perhaps it was for the nation of Israel, that God would save them and rescue them. He's praying for the people He's praying for their nation, or maybe it's the prayer that he and Elizabeth have been praying for many, many years to have a child. Is it that prayer that he's praying? Or is it both? I think in this case, obviously, it, it was actually was both prayers that God was hearing. And as God says, your prayer has been heard, he's really referring to all of Zechariah's prayers. Does God ever not hear our prayers? <laughs> I think he always hears our prayers. I mean, he's omniscient after all. And so and it wasn't as if he'd finally prayed enough to get God's attention. Sometimes I think if we pray hard enough, God will get, you know, God will do what I'm asking him to do. But God had been hearing Zechariah and Elizabeth's prayer throughout their marriage. They just didn't see the answers. The answers hadn't come yet. And over time, they became less expectant. But now God's timing is right. Now in this moment in their life, God is bringing the answer that they'd been hoping for. And I just want to encourage you today, God hears your prayers. Even when they're not answered the way we think they should be answered, even when they are impossible, he is listening, he cares, he hears your prayers for your husband, he hears your prayers for your children, he hears your prayers for your grandchildren, he hears your prayers about your finances, he hears your prayers about your estranged relationships, he hears your prayers for your church in your neighborhood. He hears your prayers. And so the angel tells him, you will have a son. He will be a delight to you. He will be filled with the spirit from birth. He will be great in the eyes of the Lord. And you notice the angel leaves out certain things about, we know this is going to become John the Baptist. The angel doesn't mention that he's going to live in the desert and eat insects. That's not mentioned. Or that he's going to grow up and he's going to wear strange clothes. And the angel doesn't mention that John will one day be unjustly imprisoned 
and ultimately killed for what he believes. So the angel leaves out some things and focuses on the blessings of his life. There would be heartache, but there would also be joy. And this moment is the beginning of what would be a season of miracles. This is the beginning of God showing up in history and ushering in the age of the Messiah where God would be at work redeeming his people. We're gonna see many prophecies throughout this passage, that these promises that God makes. And I just wanna remind you that we live in this day and era. Like we live in the age of the Messiah and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so this is a special season where God is actively doing what is impossible. And I'm so thankful for God's answers to prayers, aren't you? Are you facing some challenges? You know, we have unanswered prayers and answered prayers. But I was even looking back on the last month in my own life thinking, where has God answered my prayers? You know, just in small challenges and large challenges. So in the last month, our kids got COVID. Not all of them, but most of them, including our grandbaby who ended up in the hospital. And that's never supposed to happen to babies. Right? I mean, you don't think that's going to happen, but ended up Children's Hospital. I'm thankful that they're all well now. Well, and then my parents got COVID too, and they're both in assisted living and have tons of health risks. This just happened. They're still in isolation. They had to spend Thanksgiving alone praying for them, but I'm thankful that they're getting better. And then we had a very close friend whose cousin was kidnapped in Israel on the border. Israeli citizen was kidnapped has been in captivity, we've been praying with her for her cousin in what, just a couple days ago, just this past week, her cousin was released. That doesn't, yeah, we th we're thankful, we're thankful. So thankful, we rejoice with her, we believe it's a miracle. At the same time, there's many tragedies that are happening at the same time. Some, you know, there's unanswered prayers and there's answered prayers. There's inbreakings of the kingdom of God and there's also this tragic broken world that we live in. So what do we do? Do we stop praying because of the tragedy and the difficulty and the pain that people are suffering? No, God wants us to keep our faith and to keep praying and calling upon him because prayer is powerful. So God gives all these promises to, uh, to Zechariah. And so what does he, how does he respond to this? With praise, with joy, with faith? No, he doesn't. He has his doubts. He's like, what? Physically, this is impossible. What the angel has said is, is impossible. Theologically, what the angels has said is questionable. I'm questioning it myself. How can he be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth? The Messiah hasn't even come and died and redeemed him yet. How is this even possible? Is the angel right? I don't know. It seems wrong to me. And according to my theology, he wonders, I mean, Zechariah might even wonder, what is in this incense? I mean, gosh, I'm seeing things. So how is this possible? You know, but if you try correcting God, just try correcting God. Try correcting God's theology. See how far you can get with it. You won't get very far. So Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I'm an old man and my wife is well along in years. I'm glad he didn't say she was an old woman. That's a very nice way of saying it. And so he responds though in this moment with unbelief. It's like, I'm not sure you're right about this, Gabriel. Can I get this in writing in case you didn't notice? Not too many people our age are having children, starting families. And so if you're in that place where you struggle to believe, you're in good company. You're like Zechariah. If you question some points of Christian theology, you're not alone. Join the club. If you wish you could be sure, if you wish you had more proof, you're not alone. Life circumstances get discouraging. It seems impossible to keep hope alive, but I just encourage you, just bring your needs to the Lord. Keep bringing your needs to the Lord. God didn't save us so that we could have all the answers. He saved us so that we could have a relationship with him and so that we could walk with him. He saved us so that he might be a part of our lives forever. So what do you need from the Lord? Bring that to the Lord today. So the angel in verse 19, in response to his unbelief, the angel said to him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news, this is good news, and now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, what, which will come true at their appointed time. Just notice God's words come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting, for Zechariah was wondering, or for Zechariah, and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. He's having this long conversation with the angel. 
And when he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. So Zechariah has his doubts. He expresses those doubts, and there's consequences because of his unbelief. I see this part of the story as a principle, a biblical principle, of the principle of sowing and reaping. We reap what we sow. So if we sow in faith and belief, and we sow good, you know, we'll reap good things. And if we sow, as the Bible says, to please the sinful nature, we reap destruction. You can read about that in Galatians chapter 6. If we sow to please the Spirit, we will reap life. And so the angel confronts Zechariah and says, you did not believe my words. But consequences, they're not the same as punishment. I just want to make this very clear. Zechariah is being disciplined by the Lord. I wouldn't call it punishment. I would call it discipline. And discipline has a specific goal in mind, an outcome in mind. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 and 11 says that God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, no, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Have, has anyone here been disciplined by the Lord? <laughs> you know, but hopefully we learn from those moments and we grow through those moments. And we can learn through God's discipline of us, but we can also learn from God's discipline of others. Like, what, what could Zechariah have done differently in this moment that we could learn from? What would have been a better response for him? Well, there's another story about this little, this young woman named Mary who was 16 years old and not very old. And what was her response to the angel? May it be so as you have said versus the doubtful Zechariah. So we can learn th from those situations. May we, though, be people who pray, who trust, and who believe that God will be faithful and will keep his promises. I think that's part of the lesson of this story, is to be these kind of people. Like, I'm just gonna keep believing, I'm gonna keep hoping, I'm gonna keep praying, because God is faithful. No matter what happens in circumstances, this is what God wants us to do, to be people of audacious faith. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna persevere, you're gonna keep standing, no matter what happens. Well, verse 23, when the time of his service was completed, he returned home, and after this, his wife, Elizabeth, became pregnant, and for five months, she remained in seclusion. I think they just wanted to make sure this baby was going to make it because she was high-risk pregnancy. Uh, the Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and has taken away my disgrace among the people. Notice that point of disgrace. That's how they felt until this moment. God does a miracle. Nine months pass. She carries the baby all the way to full term. And verse 57 says, when it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. And his mother spoke up and said, no, he is to be called John. They said to her, there's no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to the father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet, and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately, his mouth was opened, his tongue was set free, and he began to speak, praising God. And all the neighbors were filled with awe throughout the hill country of Judea. People were talking about all these things, and everyone who heard this wondered about it, asking, what then is this child going to be? For the Lord's hand was upon him. And then his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. Uh, you can read this whole prophecy in Luke chapter 1. It's pretty long. I'm going to just kind of skip over a few things just because of time. But here's some key points to it, beginning in verse 76. Zechariah, prophesying about his child, says, You, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. And as the child grew and became strong in spirit, and he lived in the wilderness until he appeared publicly to Israel. So Zechariah and Elizabeth experienced this incredible provision of God to meet their deepest needs. 
And then he prophesies about his son. And God was going to provide three things. One, the assurance of God's favor. Remember, they felt God's disfavor. They felt God's, they felt disgrace because of their life circumstances. But God provides all of us with an assurance of his favor. If you've been going to church for very long, you know that the grace of God is God's undeserved, unmerited favor. The grace of God is extended to us. It's not something we earn. It's something offered to us. How will we we respond to the grace, the favor of God that's available to us today? And so John needed to know that God heard his prayers and loved him. So they named their son John, which means he has given grace and favor. That's what John means. Is that right, John? Did you know this, John Geisler? He has given (laughs) grace and favor. His life has been transformed from one of disgrace to grace, amazing grace. God has extended his favor to you here in this room or online as well. Secondly, God answers, gives, provides miraculous answers to prayer. He experiences God's provision for a son to carry on his legacy, but whatever you're praying for and have been praying for, God has heard your prayers. I just gotta tell you, God has heard your prayers already. As a pastor, I pray for this church constantly. I pray for the needs of the ministries of this church. I pray for the staff all the time. I feel like it's kind of a heavy burden at times, just praying for New Life Church and praying for this community and praying for our staff and praying for our leaders. But this is so important, but I trust God with those prayers, that he hears those prayers. And even as we have had our missions month last month and just praying for God's provision, I just want to share with you that last weekend, just last weekend, we had $93,000 given to our missions offering. So I just praise God for that. I'm thankful for that. And, you know, there will be more offerings given between now and the end of the year. But that's just one example of God's provision. You know, that, there's more to go to make our budget. But guess what? God's going to take care of it as he's taking care of you. Whatever you're praying for, whatever you're contending for, God has heard your prayers. And then the third thing is that God provides us with the presence of the Holy Spirit. And this is what redemption really is all about, being able to walk with God, being able to know God, being being able to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, in communion with God. And so the presence of the Holy Spirit is in your life. You may be praying for God's leading in your life. You may be praying for a miracle right now. Maybe you're in a doubt stage where you're wondering, oh God, where are you? Are you really here? And I just encourage you, ask the Lord to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Ask God to fill you with the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Know this, we are not left to the mercy of a roll of a dice or a spin of a wheel. God is providing healing, redemption, salvation, mercy, rescue, protection, peace, and forgiveness. And we see all these things reflected in Zechariah's prophecy. So in this season, God is your source of provision. Man, I just had this image of uh, Christmas vacation, right? Where Chevy Chase is trusting in his boss to give him his Christmas bonus so that he can get the pool for his family. Do we trust in a, are we trusting in a bonus for provision or are we trusting in the Lord for provision? God is good and he's providing for us. Heidi talked about God providing us with hope last week. May we have that unwavering trust in the unchanging nature of God. That's what hope is. And he will shine his light into areas of darkness into areas of death and grief. He will guide our feet into the path of peace. And so earlier today, we lit the Bethlehem candle. We were remembering God's provision as we lit that second candle of Advent. You know, and as I think about the Bethlehem candle, the second candle of Advent, Mary and Joseph didn't have a place to have their child, but God provided. It was dirty, it was small, but it was part of God's plan. So sometimes things that we don't think are good enough by our view are actually good enough from God's view. And in this text today, we see God providing an answer to prayer. Late in Zechariah's timeline, but exactly on time in God's timeline. 
God providing salvation for his people, heaven touching earth, the Holy Spirit enabling the impossible to take place. The Holy Spirit wants us to have our own Zechariah experiences. You know, probably not with the angel showing up in our house, but with God working in and through your life. Jesus, who said the very hairs on your head are numbered, that he who cares for the lilies of the field and the birds of the air will care for the needs in your own life. So may we encounter God's provision today. What is it that you need? Let's pray and respond to the Lord. And Heidi, why don't you come on up here too? On the stage. Lord God, we thank you that you are faithful, as we sang earlier, that you are the provider. And Lord, you invite us to live lives of faith and confidence in you. Lord, that you hear our prayers that you remove our disgrace, that you are present in our lives through the Holy Spirit. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I just invite you to bring to the Lord whatever you need right now, anything that's weighing on you, that you need God's provision for. Offer that to him. Pray about that one more time. Give it over to the Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. But when you came in, you were handed a communion cup. If you didn't get one, they are available at the exits in this room. Um, and so you can go grab one right now. If you're online, we are doing communion today. Go ahead and find some crackers or some bread and some juice. You can join us. Today is the perfect day to do communion because the second candle of Advent is called the Bethlehem candle. In some traditions, Bethlehem means house of bread. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes in me will never go thirsty. And so go ahead and take the bread out and let's respond to Jesus today. Jesus, you are the bread of life. And then Lord, what a promise you made. He who comes to you would never go hungry. Lord, at times we live lives of worry, focusing on our deficiencies, or what we perceive to be not enough. And yet, Lord, you say that you will satisfy us. We will not have to hunger. That you will provide, that you will watch over us, that you will take care of us. Lord, as we hold this bread, we are reminded that you sacrificed yourself, that we might be whole, that you were broken, that we might be whole and healed. We are reminded today that you provide. And so we receive this, remembering what you did for us on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and receive the bread now. Amen. And as we hold this cup, it reminds us that not only is he the bread of life, but he also, wherever we are thirsty, he fills us. The cup what, what is in your cup that you need right now? Like what emptiness do you feel or what is there that you recognize you thirst for right now? And what is it that he wants to fill? This, let this cup be a reminder of him meeting those needs and filling your thirst. He said that when we take the cup from him, that we will never be thirsty again. Lord Jesus, thank you that you fill us in every single part of our lives, in every place that we need, even when we don't recognize our needs, Lord Jesus. You come, you highlight them, you show us and reveal to us those places so that we can be filled, that we won't go thirsty, we won't go hungry. And Lord Jesus, we receive this cup right now and we receive what you have for us, whatever that is in our life. Reveal that to us, and as we receive this, meet that. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. Go ahead and drink it all. Amen. Amen. We'll stand together. We're going to continue to worship him. And as we do so, let's remember God is our source of provision. Would you just stand with us?
And we're just going to sing this chorus together because I feel like it's just so good after what we just heard. So let's sing. Because all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Come on, we sing that again all my life. So my life you have been faithful. Yes, you have Lord. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will see of the goodness. the goodness of God. Lord, you, Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can receive your provision. And Lord, with your provision, that you offer us life. You offer us joy. You offer us peace. Everything that we think about this Christmas, everything we hear in those Christmas carols and in the songs we hear in the stores, Lord Jesus, all those things people are longing for, you provide. Lord, we thank you for your provision. May we live in that provision every day. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. Amen. Well, this week, leave with the provision of God, being aware that he generously blesses you and you can walk in the fullness of who he is this week. All right, enjoy this week, a first week of Christmas, right? December. <laughs> All right, have a great week. <laughs>